the German philosopher Friedrich Nietz said, and I quote, what does not kill you makes you stronger. And end of quote. How relevant these words are and have been to me and my family for the last few years cannot be emphasized enough. In January 2009, my wife and I um, sat at the back of Colonial Plaza, for those of you in Nandy, who, kn who know Nandy, it's towards uh, the airport, at 2 a.m. in the morning, um, sharing a packet of pretzels while the rain screamed outside. You see, we, we actually went there because it was just a deluge of rain that particular night, and we had to make our way to the warehouse to see what was going on. By the time we got to the warehouse, uh, I mean, most warehouses are built sort of off the street. There was fish already swimming outside from waters that was building up. At about 2.30 a.m., flood waters started sipping from the bottom of the shutter door and from toilet holes and what have not, all, all, the, all the little gaps that was within that building. Knowing what was coming next, we started in vain to try and move about two million worth of stock to higher ground. Imagine my wife and myself. N of course, this was an impossible task. So by 4.30 or so, the waters were touching my hips and therefore almost touching the um, uh, light switches because obviously the electricity was still on at the time. So we risked electrocution if we stayed, knowing we were literally seeing our life's savings, um, everything we had basically literally being washed away in front of our eyes. We knew that this was, this was it. With heavy hearts, we decided to get out of the building. Um, my wife almost drowned that night. This, ladies and gentlemen, was the 209 floods that hit Nandi. We had two locations, um, the business in Nandi town and our warehouse, which was also open to the public at the back of Colonial Plaza. Both of them were inundated. On the third day after the floods had receded, I went alone into wa our warehouse, fearing she may not be able to take it. And I remember sitting on a wooden pallet, the, you know, the floods had sort of pushed the pallets all together, on my knees, emotionless, like a zombie, for a lack of a better word. When the shock wore off as to what I was seeing, this is a 10,000 square foot warehouse, that had just been ravaged by 11 foot of water, 11 foot of water. So it's very hard to imagine for those who haven't gone through it. When the shock wore off, I was overwhelmed. And at the time, the instincts that I had was, there was one thing repeating in my head, run. And run meaning at the time we were New Zealand residents, we had come to Fiji to invest, come back to Fiji rather to invest. And the run meant we could go back and work at the warehouse or came out in New Zealand. That's exactly what we would be doing. There was only one problem with this, and I had never personally run from adversity in my life, no matter what my instincts were telling me. So I knew if I ran, I would be a coward in the eyes of my wife, uh, my loving wife and my loving daughter, and more importantly, my self-esteem would never recover after this. So I believe, so, so we I decided to stay back and fight. Fight a loss that basically took us to zero. Now in life, I believe, in two, I believe that two things shape who you become. What your upbringing was like and who you marry. Of course, my wife will insist that it's the letter. So I will reserve my comments. <laughs> born to hardworking but poor parents, um, I in Suva, I was born in Suva. I realized the importance of money at an early age. My father was a bus builder. My mother was a, uh, a domestic worker for most of her life. Having three children to feed, life was fairly hard for them and we had to forego a lot of things. My father uh, worked very, very long hours just to get the overtime money so that he could put 
at least food on the table. And, and oftentimes, even that was, a, uh, uh, that was not possible. Now, he, I, I barely saw my father. Uh, to this day, I don't really know him that well, because even on Sundays, he would be working, on most Sundays. Now, being so poor, um, I attended school up to probably class six, as they would say, in yeah, class six with no shoes. I remember the first sandal that my parents bought me, and they told me a week before that they could afford to buy me a sandal. I dreamt of it for about a week, maybe a week and a half. I dreamt of all sorts of things, how I would walk, my swagger. I dreamt how people would look at my sandal and <laughs> what I would look like. Um, and I finally got it, and I, I actually developed that walk, and, and I wore it. And I swear that was probably the cleanest sandal for a few years after I, I had actually received it, because I had that was the only shoes I could afford for so many years. Um, <coughs> there were times when we slept hungry. Um, the food that we could eat and we would have would usually be flour, that's available in most homes in Fiji. So flour and sugar, so roti with sugar would be our dinner. And uh, that's basically how I grew up. I remember a well-to-do family in our neighborhood. We uh, had two kids, two boys. I used to play with them. And uh, I remember one night we were invited to a religious function at their place. And towards 9, 30, 10, the mother is pleading with these two boys to have their customary glass of milk. Obviously, I, well, I, I didn't know, but a lot of families would, we didn't have milk. I mean, milk was a luxury. So these two boys were given milk every night as part of their diet to sleep. And here I was thinking, if they don't have it, can I have both the glasses, please? <laughs> you know? I mean, who refuses milk? But obviously somebody refuses it who has it every day. So it was, it was difficult. And for a deprived kid, it was, um, it was madness for somebody to refuse milk. While growing up, I actually thought that my family was the norm. I mean, that, that, that the fact that we were poor, well, sorry, wasn't the norm, that we were an exception. And now that I've grown up and, and know a hell of a lot more about the world, uh, this is sadly the face of poverty in Fiji and the face of poverty all over the world. There are countless thousands of kids who go through life the way I did. Um, I unfortunately didn't have the luxury of uh, family uh, business or background to, be to fall back on. Um, so, in, dis in disadvantaged homes in Fiji, in all over Fiji, what my life was like is repeated over and over again. So in many ways, as much as my story is remarkable to me and perhaps to others who listen to it, it is barely remarkable if you put it in the context of the greater scheme of where the world is at, at this point in time. What poverty does, though, in so many cases, and if you go through Fiji's uh, business community, you probably find at least 50, 60 percent of the folks like me. Uh, what poverty does is it creates a fire inside you, a fire that is fueled by people laughing at you for not having the right clothes, for not being cool enough, for not being socially acceptable. Um, I remember I was, a, I was educated at Marius Brothers High School from uh, form two to form six, and the Marius Social, where Marius boys have a party with the so St. Joseph girls, so we have an end of your social ball. I didn't have clothes. So guess what I was doing? Making barbecue for everybody else outside. I couldn't go in. It was just too um, indignifying. In, in my clothes were just t totally inappropriate for that particular uh, event. Anyway, so what poverty does is actually creates that hunger. And a hunger for financial success, no matter what the cost. And um, I'm pretty sure um, your parents, Viraj, your great-grandparents who came in, they had the same. So I'm kind of in that boat the moment, or I was at the time, starting out in life. The survival skills that one learns, being poor, fuels this hunger. As you see opportunities where others don't. For instance, most people in this audience probably don't know. Boiled cassava, those who know, everybody in Fiji knows cassava. And dried coconut, picked off the tree. Eaten together is a great meal, particularly when you're very, very hungry. So most people don't know this. 
The point is, a person with limited resources, who doesn't have much in life, would try something as unlikely as that. And perhaps most of the world's food has been put together that way. Somebody trying something unlikely. Point is, so, so the, the business world is very much like that. It is, it rewards risk takers. Um, after beating them down usually a few times, and God knows I have been beaten down two or three times. I've started businesses that have failed miserably. Then you learn, then you pick up yourself and get on with life again. Then you fail again, then you start again. But that's the hallmark of a lot of business people. Um, <coughs> When starting a business, most successful people will tell you that even their children have been mortgaged to the banks. I'm not, I don't mean it literally, but they own you. My daughter just turned 18, my lovely daughter is sitting there. I just freed her recently from the banks. <laughs> that requires courage and conviction and skills that only life's hard knocks can teach you. They don't teach these things. They don't teach um, the negotiation skills, the the hard-nosedness, the, the fighting skills that a business person has at, at any law school, I mean any business school. You can send your kids to Harvard, they won't come out. The guys who learn on the street how to, s how to run a business, start it and get it up the ground, off the ground, and they failed a few times, they're the ones with that resilience that can fight on and fight on and fight on. My journey into the business world started when I was perhaps six years old. My mother, to get rid of me early from the house, somehow got me enrolled got me enrolled at the local primary school. Um, and most of you have never heard of this school. It's called Nevesi Primary School. Um, it's in Dele Nevesi. It's a, Dele Nevesi is a small suburb in Suva. This is, Dele Nevesi is famous for the rubbish dump that is across the road, or was across the road in Suva. So I grew up there. And most of you know, who know me also know that I, know that I speak the Bowen dialect fluently. And how this happened, I will tell you. The school that I attended for eight years had no students of any of Indian heritage except me. And I and I and, and my sorry, my brother joined, but three years later. So I had no choice. I took vernacular, the Fijian vernacular language as an elective uh, subject. And all my friends were it okay. So I had to embrace the culture and language or be alienated. Full stop. That was it. I had to learn it. So anyway, I found out very quickly that my Itoki friends love roti. So guess what? 20 to 30 parcels were ordered for my mother every day. This is a six-year-old boy. Um, and sold at school for 20 cents. This is uh, a very long time ago. This is about 30 odd years ago. So 20 cents was a lot of money. <laughs> this helped with bus fare and the odd expenses here and there. By the time I was about nine years old, eight or nine years old, my father had um, managed to secure a block of land to build our house in. Nothing fancy, just a, a usual uh, shack, you know, made out of corrugated iron and timber. And all the arable land, because the house was so small, there was a lot of land left. Um, so I planted virtually every piece of that land with all the vegetables you could think of. And I sold vegetables after school. So I'd come home and my mother would have, had them, would have them bundled and I'll have a cup of tea or whatever was available, load my uh, sack, wear my raincoat and my police hat. Th those days they used to make these police raincoats, black ones with a police hat. So I'd keep that with me and go through all the villages and the homes and sold my vegetables. So the business skills that I've acquired over, have over now, I'm sorry, o o that I've acquired and that has helped me in this life uh, now uh, was honed as a, as a boy, when I was a little boy. And so I left school and because I, I got marks just sort of below the scholarship uh, cutoff, and because my father could not afford uh, to send me to tertiary school, I opted to work. And I joined ANZ Bank was my first employer. And Bank of Hawaii was my second employer for about six months or so. Quite frankly, I found banking boring and frustrating. And the reason why I say it was frustrating, more, more frustrating than boring, is I could touch and hold so much money, but none of it was mine. <laughs> you know, I'd be a teller, and R.B. Patel would bring in $100,000 for a deposit on Monday morning, and I'd count it, but it wasn't mine. So that was frustrating. Um, 
So believe me, um, so in 1995, I'd left banking and I joined uh, Tetz Lotto as a, uh, as a sales representative. In 1995, I met my lovely wife, who's also in the audience. Um, and you know, only a few days after meeting her and dating her, I knew I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. And we became like two peas in a pod. We got legally married in less than three months. I know that's quick. Um, <laughs> and our journey into the real world as a couple began. Now, right about this time, I lost my job with Fiji Tesoro for various reasons. Um, and I had just gotten married, so there was no money. Nothing, nothing to, to go on that honeymoon or to, to impress my wife. So for about a year, I was unemployed. And I did everything from selling food. I've sold food from here to Lotoka. I've done plumbing. I've done carpentry. My father-in-law was a plumber. So I moved from Suva to Nandi uh, to look for a job here. But I stayed with my father-in-law. So for one year, I did odd, odd jobs, virtually anything and everything. And on hindsight now, I'm very, very proud of what I've done uh, at that stage. I mean, uh, work is work. And if it, put foods on the it's pu it put puts food on the table, so be it. And, and hence, because of that, that period, that one-year period and, and my early childhood, what I've done, I, I've learned to appreciate everybody's work. Um, my wife knows this quite well, I, that we drive it, you know, come to watch the movies, and I'd see a guy sleep, uh, sweeping the streets, and my heart melts, because I know what he's going through. And he's getting paid nothing. But imagine if these guys weren't around, what Fiji would look like. A filthy quagmire, literally. So we don't appreciate work for what it is. Our society has become that, that we put social status on work. And that is not right, in fact. Um, anyway, so our life just begun. Our breakthrough, breakthrough came when I started immigration consultancy. How I got into this is a long story, and it's best kept for another day, but I am one of the, f not probably, probably one of the few um, Australian tertiary, tertiary qualified, which I got later on, immigration consultants. Um, and I practiced in that particular business for about eight years or so. What I can tell you is a lot of, I sent a lot of families to New Zealand and Australia, and our firm be quickly became number one in the migration consultancy industry in Fiji. The 2000 coup for us was a godsend, and we did very, very well. While it was lucrative for us, the paperwork and the tedious nature was getting to me. I, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, after the 2000 coup, uh, probably I think it was 2001 or 2002, everybody was trying to get out. And I was like a demigod, for the lack of a better word. People were coming, wanting to go. And, and so two weeks, uh, two, there was a two weeks break during Christmas which we, when we closed the office. My family and I were on a well-deserved break at the Warwick Resort. And I'm swimming uh, in the swimming pool, and I come across this ledge. I hold on to the ledge, and I see somebody's feet there. And the feet does not look like somebody who's at a resort on holiday. Who's wearing a chapel, you know, the Indian chapel that you'd wear with a sari or... So I slowly look up, and there's this lady standing there with salwar kameez, fully dressed near the pool. Are you Mr. Riaz Ali? Can I see you for some immigration advice? <laughs> that was... <laughs> That was probably the, 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 the straw that broke the camel's back. And <laughs> it, but it was a bit the beginning of the end. So I, we did this for, I, did the, I practiced as a consultant for many years. But as I said, I started burning out. And we decided to finally close the practice. By then, my parents had left Fiji for New Zealand. And uh, we decided to leave. So by towards the end of 2004, we left Fiji. I spent, oh sorry, we spent one year in New Zealand doing what we in Fiji refer to as official macaron, meaning absolutely nothing. <laughs> While we love New Zealand, and still do, something about Fiji just stopped us from settling in. I, I don't know, up till this day I don't know. And could be um, the bad roads, <laughs> the um, garbage on the side of the streets, the endless illogical paperwork that you have to do just to get your water connected, Maybe the coups. I don't know. 
but something keeps getting some of us back to Fiji. Maybe it's our crave for imperfection. Maybe it's the fact that somehow Fiji is still real. You know, you go overseas and everything is just so perfect. And in three days, I'm scratching my head and scratching the walls. I want to go back to Fiji. Because <laughs> yeah. it's too perfect. <laughs> right? You don't have anybody to yell at. You sh you know, everybody is so sensible with their driving. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. And we came back to Fiji with a, with a bit of capital and looking for opportunities. While, grow while growing up, one thing I had in mind all the time was the fact that I always wanted to own a shop. Now, in Delinda Vesey, where we lived, for about five, five minutes away, there was a, uh, a Chinese uh, shopkeeper. His name was Lo Moon. And... I love this old man, Lo Moon. He was, he was, a, he was a grouchy fellow, so, but, but he, he served customers well, e efficiently, but he wasn't a pleasant fellow. So if you walked into his shop, first thing he'll ask you, what do you want? <laughs> yeah. I know another guy in Vatuolevu does that, another shopkeeper. I just met him. He's, he reminds me so much of Lo Moon. There's a bread shop in Vatuolevu. You walk in, you go, what do you want? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so very stern. But I always wondered what it felt like being behind the counter, because this guy had you know, all these lovely things at the back that we wanted to buy. So you take your money to the shopkeeper who has all these nice things that he always seems to have without running out, and you had to give him your shiny coin because, you know, that's all we could afford, the shiny coin, no notes. So he gave you the stuff you wanted and still had a lot behind him. So he took your money and still had stuff. So that was a win-win. And for a kid, that was for a kid who didn't have much, this shopkeeper was a definition of heaven because he had all the lollies, all the candies and everything, and you also had to give him your money. The childhood ambition of becoming a store owner led to Best Buys. And those of you who, have, those of you who know, um, we own two stores now. So we wanted something different when we came back from New Zealand, and we decided to source our products out of the U.S. market, and the rest, as they say, is history. Our shop is uh, in the Maka. It's unique. We bring things uh, that are picked, uh, hand-picked, and we've been in business now for 12 years. Now, when we got the shop open, and this is the second part of, of our life, that is when my wife's true abilities became evident. She challenged my ideas and stood her ground on things that she knew, she knew was right. Now, unfortunately, my ego, I'm a man, huh? so prevented me from listening, and I made mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes, and I lost a lot of money. Um, eventually, I came around to realizing that women shop, men buy. <laughs> we, go, we go, milk, okay. Yeah, so we out. So I had to let go of my ego and let her take the lead. In other words, I had to come from the 18th century back to the, tw well, come into the 21st century and let my wife take the lead in thing on the things that I didn't know anything about. And that's how our business got from strength to strength. From strength, to strength. In the last 12 years or so, we've gone through three floods, two very big ones, a coup, and God knows how many cyclones. Uh, but our tenacity as a couple, has, and our never-say-die never attitude has brought us to where we are today, despite the adversities we have faced. Things do get easier when you have two people with similar determinations uh, standing by side by side. We have had days when, we, when all we had to eat was bread and tea. We made sure, however, that neither of us felt life was hopeless. We convinced each other that there was, that was the best bread money could buy. And if it was the Fiji long loaf, for those of you who are familiar with the long loaf, with a bit of butter, then it made convincing easier because it was good bread. So we always told ourselves that tomorrow would be better. And because we believed that tomorrow would be better, it indeed was. Twelve years ago, when, I, when we started our business together, after running to Fiji, we measured success only by the amount of money we had. The floods taught us a couple of profound lessons. The first one being, trust the weathermen. <laughs> when he says it will flood, even if it doesn't, put your stuff up. <laughs> right? <laughs> this, right? And the second, that, you know, all these things we have, the material things, if the big guy, for those of you who believe in the big guy upstairs, uh, 
if he wants to get rid of your things, he'll take it. And all it takes is a snap of a finger. And we saw it literally wash away. So today almost, so we, we've learned to cherish life, not the things that we have. And we've, we, we've, we measure success now by how many people's lives we touch. At the moment, we employ 42 people. In so in other words, we're putting food on 42 people's plates, and we're proud of that. Um, almost seven years after that, we do not, sorry, uh, we are a small company now. We st still have only 42 people, and we're not a wealthy company. But we are proud of what we have achieved. We help family and friends in need and strive to make our lives relevant beyond our business. So the business doesn't define us, as Sharon said. It's being relevant outside of your business. That's what matters. Today, my wife and I find happiness and satisfaction in small things, like the Sunday lunch we have uh, together as a family, or a bottle of wine we have after a hard day's work, or helping someone fulfill their dreams by guiding them and assisting, assisting them. I can't even begin to tell you how much satisfaction we get by growing things. So as I said, part-time farmer. So, be it vegetables or flowers. Do not get me wrong. I mean, we enjoy the business world as much as we did when we first started. Uh, but at in the journey now, we have learned to smell the roses, if you may. And, you know, mo making money is no longer the sole objective. And it is the journey that one must enjoy within that rat race that we all put ourselves into that you must look within to find yourself. Huh? At the end of the day, we acquire and do in our lifetime. At the end of the day, what we acquire and do in our lifetime is just a game, which no one really wins. It's really a zero-sum game. We'll leave everything behind and go. So we, we're playing this game, and we'll just lose. No, nobody wins. So death is a great leveler, and I hate to be morbid about this. It's a great leveler. No matter how many degrees one has, no matter how many billions you have in your account, um, we all leave it and go. So what we look at life now is it's, it's a game that we are going to spend maybe 50, 60 years, and Dr. Zen will know the average life expectancy in Fiji. So people don't play the game any too long in Fiji. What I'm saying to all of you today, if you lose your fear, fear is like a rock holding a bird down. If you lose your fear and treat life as a short game that you've got to play and win, you'll start soaring like a bird. Thank you very much.